All right, I will say hello and welcome back to another episode of The Balance Breakdown. Um, and today, this is going to be a post-show for UFC 254, uh, but mostly it's just going to be an inauguration of Habib's greatness. Um, for this, I am joined by Habib's biggest fan, uh, the only shill possible for this kind of podcast, and that is the shill himself, Sean McGuinness. How are you doing, sir? Very good, thank you, Harry. I'm I'm glad that I was proven right as well. But I'm sure you know we got the whole podcast. I'm sure we we'll get onto that later. You know, I I thought about this. Like I I have this bet with Steve every week. We do a bet, and I've absolutely pummeled him into the ground for the last three weeks. Um, and and actually last night was quite close. I picked all of the prelim fights correct, bar um Sam Alvey down Young being a draw. Like I mean, Jesus Christ, what are you gonna do? But um. <laughs> pretty much everything else I picked and then Bobby Knuckles was like yeah fuck you and Justin Gaethje was like yeah fuck you so those weren't great but um we'll go through the picks as we go through the card obviously because we should um we should put, shine some light on Jack's incredible picking um but before we get in like um maybe let's start and finish with Habib like let's talk a little bit about the retirement first like obviously for those of you that didn't watch um essentially as soon as Habib won and his hand was raised he um he let out all of these emotions in the middle of the cage um, and he took his gloves off whilst he was being announced that he was the winner and still the champion. And he put his gloves on the ground and announced his retirement. Um, now, MMA retirements are, are always what they are. But Sean, originally, do you want to just give me your thoughts on on that retirement and, and, and Habib's performance? Well, yeah, we were talking about it a little bit before we came on. And you're right, I think any retirement in MMA you've got to sort of treat with a little bit of skepticism but the thing that makes Khabib different is he's very different to the vast majority of MMA fighters in terms of what drives him to actually compete in the sport Agreed. Um, you know a lot of guys it is you know whether it's fame or you know usually money um, say for example like a retirement we've seen recently with Henry Cejudo like when Henry Cejudo said he retired, I had no reaction at all because I was thinking this is probably, um, you know, a ploy to get a better contract, get better pay, whatever. The strange thing with Habib is he's so principled um, and doesn't seem, I think, first of all, he really doesn't like the fame. I don't think he likes being in the public eye as well. I think he's a very private guy at heart. And second of all, I genuinely don't think he was ever really driven by money, which is kind of a crazy thing and probably one of the reasons we all found this like retirement kind of um, a little bit somber was that it made you realise that he was doing all of this for his dad, essentially. And then yeah. when his dad wasn't there, he's almost like, well, that was the reason I was doing it. I don't have any other reason to be doing this. And then obviously his other parent, when his mum has sort of, turned around behind the scenes and said this has to be your last fight he's like cool cool we'll do it so you know they do have to be treated with skepticism but Habib's a very unique guy um in terms of why he chooses um you know to compete and what drives him I agree um and we'll get into this ne near the end of the podcast when we actually get to his um get to his fight but the timeline that he spelled out in that post fight interview to say that his father had been dead for three days three days and Dana called him with the Justin fight and he went to his mother then and was like look what shall we do essentially and you know as you've rightly pointed out his mom said look you shouldn't do this without your dad you shouldn't do it and Habib said look let me do this one for dad and then obviously we saw what happened um there was lots of skepticism going in about how would it affect him would it affect him positively? Would it affect him mentally? And Dan Hardy said it best. There is not a lightweight in the world that would have beaten Habib last night. Not a lightweight in the world. Um, but yeah, we'll get into a little bit more about Habib as we as we move on in the card. If we if we jump right in at the first fight of the night, um, this was actually a phenomenal performance, really. It was uh, Joel Alvarez versus Alexander Yakov. Joel Alvarez comes out with the uh, first round armbar. Uh, what did you think of this? Yeah, I thought he looked good. I thought that a lot of what he was doing, it looked pretty similar to when he fought uh, Joe Duffy as well. Like, yep. he's, he's a very good kicker. He's a very powerful kicker as well. And um, it looked like he was going to start working the legs of um, Alexander. And then 
after Alexander went in for that takedown, that guillotine looked close. It did. Um, and, I, and I think it's cool how he managed to transition to the armbar. Because I was saying to my little brother, like, um, especially in men's MMA, seeing an armbar sub from someone off their back is so rare, you yeah. know, once you get to this level, so rare. So um, I was really, I, I was impressed, to be honest, especially because Alexander went with, uh, went against my boy Roos about Roberts and he, he got out of all of his submission attempts. So it's going to be interesting seeing what he does moving forward, definitely. I agree. I mean, I think that just having a, a decent kicking game and then some wicked submissions off your back is not going to be enough at the highest levels. Um, but I'm really interested to see what he can add to that, right? Because the problem that, that Alvarez may come up against is that he's he was almost accepting of the takedown, right? He was like, yeah, sure, take me down. Let's see what happens. And look, in this fight, it served him pretty fucking well, right? He ended up subbing the guy. And props to you, by the way, you called a, a round one submission for Joel Alvarez. Me and Jack called a round Ooh. two submission. So uh, we'll give you a point for that one, you fucking knob. Um, but anyway, <laughs> um, we, uh, what, we, what we're going to see, I think, with Joel Alvarez is guys that have really, really good submission defense right it's good to note that alexander yakovlev has also been submitted by armbar four times in his career right so clearly that's a weakness and joel alvarez said in this post-fight press conference that um he knows that yakovlev has got really long lanky arms right so he was like i was looking for arm bars because i know that they're easier to catch with guys with longer arms obviously um but yeah overall i thought i thought alvarez looked good um i thought that you know it's good that he's got he lost his first fight. He's now on a three three fight win streak with the UFC. So, so he's got a legitimate claim to to take a, a tougher test next time, right? For for Yakovlev, I mean, Jesus, he's been fighting for eighteen years or whatever it is, like something nuts like that. Um, I don't know how long he stays around the UFC for, but at the end of the day, it is what it is. Uh, we move on to um, the spirit of Jack Sear stepping in against Alexander. <laughs> Alexander against Cowboy Oliveira. Um, just, I mean, it just goes to show really how insane of a prospect Shavkat really is. So we're talking about Shavkat Rachmanov. Um, when the the people he was supposed to fight, right? Aleski dos Santos, right? It's no fucking joke for your for your debut in the UFC. He's then replaced by. Alex Oliveira, right? Who's also no fucking joke in the UFC. And the performance that Rachmanov put out in that fight was absolutely phenomenal. I felt like um I felt like at the very start he I don't want to say nervous because it didn't look like nervous, but it almost felt like he couldn't believe that he was in there. And Alex Oliveira caught him with a really nice right hand and that woke Shavka up immediately. He like poured at his eye like, oh shit, okay, I'm in a fight here. And then from then just essentially absolutely dominated Cowboy. Um, finished him with a guillotine in the first round and it was it was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, what did you think of that fight and of Shavka? No, it was really good. Um, I agree with you, though. Like, the they weren't giving him an easy debut at all. And, you know, before this, I was comparing him to Rory McDonald a little bit. And I think we still saw shades of that. But I was Absolutely. worried that while he was um, getting accustomed to, like, those UFC jitters or whatever, I was worried that Oliveira was just going to hit him with something crazy. Because that first right hand, you know, yep. you can't be making adjustments because while fighting someone like Alex Oliveira, because he doesn't give you a chance to, you know, he's like all action from round one. But, um, but yeah, the minute he started coming forward, he landed that knee. And, Beautiful. you know, it looked like Alex Oliveira was surviving, which you don't see a great deal. Like um, nope. Alex Oliveira usually can be a tough fight for, for anyone that he's put in with. And, you know, um, I was actually speaking uh, to Louis at the time, who, who for anyone listening is someone that, competes in amateur MMA at the moment and we were talking about how usually if someone goes for that guillotine especially if it's an arm in it's like an amateur mistake it's like oh my god I can't believe you've just given top position to go for this choke you're never going to get mm -hmm. but the way he locked it up was just perfect it was it was really uh, sort of reminiscent of um Wally Alves mm -hmm. like usually someone goes for an arm in guillotine arm in especially and you're like there's no chance he's going to finish something like that um but yeah, when he Miller. went for it 
Yeah, yeah, or or Wally Alves. And when he went for it, though, you could tell straight away it was someone that knew what he was doing. Yep. Um, and, you know, and then he, he tapped out. So, so I thought it was a really good performance. Um, he's 13 and 0 now. And it would just be interesting to see who they who they give him next. Yeah, I, I've got two points to make on this fight. The first one is that actually I thought Alex Oliveira did a really, really poor job of defending that guillotine. Because if we if you go back and watch it, Shavkat makes three or four adjustments from front headlock before he pulls guard, right? And you can even see Shavkat's like, he's looking, he's like thinking in his brain. He's he's looking at the position without actually seeing it, right? He's feeling the position, feeling the position. And then you just see like, almost he can't believe that he's allowed, that Alex Oliveira is allowing him to get this position. And as soon as he locks up that arm in properly after his three or four adjustments, he, his eyes just light up and he just jumps guard immediately, right? And, and just cinches it up so tightly that Alex then taps really, really quickly. And I just feel like like Oliveira didn't do anything really to stop it. And and either that's because Shavkat gave him no ability to and his hand fighting that we couldn't see was just far superior. Because look, Alex, Alex Oliveira, he's 31 fights deep in his career, right? Like it's not like he doesn't know how to defend an Armin guillotine. Um, so I thought that was a bit strange. But equally for Shavkat, I, I wonder whether he's going to get pushed a little bit too quickly now. We saw it with Hamza, and whilst I don't imagine that Hamza, that him and Hamza are going to be on the same level, but but as you say, thirteen and zero, he's twenty five years of age, and he's just stopped Cowboy Oliveira, which just doesn't happen, right? What what do you do with him next? Do you set up the Zaleski dos Santos rematch? Like, do you book it again? Yeah, I think Zaleski is um, a good way to go. Just really quickly on that guillotine, just because I thought it was an interesting point you made about Alex's defence. Um, just a disclaimer, I've not re-watched the fights. So I, I watched it all sort of live, so I'm going on memory here. But I remember thinking what the difference was between um, Alvarez's guillotine, which obviously didn't work, mm -hmm. and why uh, Shavkat got into his and it seemed like Alex couldn't move because I actually thought it was a bit different. When um, Yoel jumped for, for the arm in guillotine, he basically went two legs uh, into close guard at the same time. And then when mm -hmm. he landed, he was flat on his back. Mm -hmm. And especially with an arm in guillotine, um, the angle that your body is at in relation to the opponent is like a critical detail. Like you can't yeah. be straight on with them, otherwise the, the choke doesn't go on. And when Shavkat went for it, which is something you see Wally Alves do and a lot of really good guillotines do, he deliberately went with that outside leg by itself first mm -hmm. so that when he was even jumping in the air, he was putting his uh, body at that like 45 degree angle. And then when he landed, it was like really on. So I, I imagine like all these things, it was a bit of both with the defense, but um, from what I can remember, it was like the application that was really good. But well, my in answer to sorry, go on. Yeah, sorry, go on. Oh, what I was um, going to say is my, my criticism was, was only, was actually before Shavka even began to pull guard. Oh, uh, okay. When so essentially what happened, right, is is when he was defending the takedown, he almost had that Arnold Allen, Mads Burnell X. Like he had his arm underneath his jaw, like basically just trying to pick him up, right, to stop him mm. from going for the single leg. But when Alex Oliveira did nothing about it, Shavkat just started to reach around the arm and claps his hands together. And then he saw like, all right, he's still not taking me down here. He's still not even trying to take me down. So he makes like three or four small adjustments with his hands. And Oliveira just stays there and doesn't do anything. And then Shavkat's eyes light up when he's still on his feet. And he's like, oh, I fucking got this guy. This is over. And then he pulls guard, as you say, expertly. Right leg comes over, angles there. And almost as soon as he hits the deck, like Oliveira's mm. tapping, right? But it's the, what I was concerned about with Oliveira maybe it's because he was rocked from the knee I don't know but mm. it felt like there was a period of six seconds in there five or six seconds where Shavkat was adjusting 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 before he pulls guard and Oliveira just did nothing about it and I was mm. like mm, okay that's strange yeah no I, I can see that I, di I didn't um know you meant when he was sort of stood against the fence but yeah. in answer to the the second part of your question about what you do with Shavkat next I'm not as worried about him getting pushed really fast the same way that Hamzat's been pushed. Because um, me and my little brother were actually talking, we were comparing them both as prospects because um, in theory, like Shavkat has, well, not in theory, like for sure he has 
a lot more experience than Hamzat mm-hmm. does coming into the UFC. He has really impressive wins, you know, outside the UFC in different organizations. But I, th- I don't think he's going to be pushed too quickly. Um, just because when Hamzat had his first fight, it was obviously really impressive. But he was straight away promoting himself as someone that could destroy anyone in the division. And I'm not even convinced. Does Shavkat actually speak English? No. No. I, I always think with a fighter, um, especially if they don't speak English, it's a massive um, intangible in terms of whether they're going to get pushed by the UFC. So mm-hmm. I think the chances are he's probably going to have more of a Leon Edwards type problem where he looks really good. Or, in fact, probably a better comparison is him and um, Magomed uh, and Kalaev, who we'll get mm-hmm. onto later. But I think he's going to have more of a similar problem to him where he becomes a bit of a dark horse and he almost won't get noticed until he reaches another big name that is in like the casual spotlight. But I think Zaleski would be a great next step for him, to be honest. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, so we'll move on to uh, Liana Zizoua, uh losing the doctor stoppage to Miranda Maverick. Um, do you want to give me your thoughts on that? What do you think of the stoppage, first of all? Yeah, I, th- I wasn't mad at the stoppage, to no, be honest. Like, it looked like the momentum was shifting in Miranda Maverick's way. And we were talking I'm not sure about. It was ever in Jojoa's favour, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, it, it was hardly like a turn of the tables, was it? You're right. But we were talking about Liana before. And, um, you know, she has, <laughs> she has a lot of arm bars off her back. But I'm just not quite sure whether there's other things in a game to sort of support that. I think she's behind a lot of these other girls when it comes to the striking, the wrestling, essentially um, (laughs) every other part of MMA, maybe. So I really wasn't mad when it was getting stopped. I know she was upset, but I couldn't see it going any other way than just her getting... I feel like initially the only thing that was keeping her safe was that I feel like Miranda was adjusting to those UFC jitters like a Mm -hmm. tiny bit. Mm -hmm. But the minute she was seeing blood, she was only going to pour the pressure on more and it was only going to get worse for Liana. I agree, I agree. I mean, I think um, the problem with it is because it is because of the amount of blood that was leaking, right? The deep, the cut was very, very deep, although it hadn't broken the nose. It was very, very deep. And and they were talking on the um, on the broadcast about how poor Liana's striking looked in previous fights and how it looked in this fight now there was definitely improvements uh liana was landing some nice left hands and some decent counters but but for me it was only going to be one-way traffic as soon as that elbow landed because i mean her face was just a mess and maverick would really started to up her confidence up her output she changed so she you know her her array of strikes was different because liana had started to counter her with uh, i think maverick was throwing like a one-two hook or a one-two low kick or whatever it was and and liana was starting to time it and whatever and then she just changed things and you could see that that liana was hoping that there was going to be uh some form of counter to either drop her or allow her to 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 fall on the mat to to throw that armbar one important note about liana is she's actually a combat uh a master's combat champion oh really yeah yeah so so in um uh, georgia i guess maybe she competed in russia i'm not sure i'm only my my understanding is that the combat the masters of combat is like a an eastern european russian type thing but yeah she's a master of combat um in sambo i believe so oh wow she's she's obviously got some super legit stuff but i just don't see it in her mma career um now of course uh, for miranda maverick i think it's um it's probably not the way that you want your debut to go right a doctor stoppage although it it looks like it's you know it's tko at the end of the day and maverick was very vocal at the end saying that she's the next big thing in, in the female division and and maybe I mean it feels like her um her own let I mean it's a UFC debut right so it's difficult to uh to, to determine exactly what we're going to see but but let's see what she looks like in her next bout um and and yeah we'll we'll go from there but but definitely definitely somebody to keep an eye on do you agree yeah yeah definitely um I think as well in um I think I'm I'm right about this. Like I'm sure we'll get onto Laura Murphy in a second, but that's they're in the same division, aren't they? Um, yes. Lauren, yeah. I think um, Lauren Murphy. I'm sure we're going to get onto that call out in a bit. Um, Greatest pro but... of all time. <laughs> I I just don't even know how to respond to that. To be honest, I'm sure we'll get to it in a bit. Um, yeah. 
Um, but yeah, I think what that spoke to was the issue they're having in this division at the moment, getting really big contenders through. So someone like Miranda Maverick, you know, they can bring some new sort of energy to the division, hopefully, to avoid any of those, <laughs> any more of those promos. Um, but I'm sure we'll get onto that in a bit. Right, so we're going to move after, on to... She beat the shit out of you. Yeah, shut your fucking mouth. That was a painful <laughs> loss, okay? Um, <laughs> we'll move on to the worst fight of the night by an absolute country mile, and that is Dan Young versus Sam Alvey. Look, what? All, all, Are you no, sure? No, Are shut you your mouth. you confused on topology? <laughs> shut your mouth. So this was a split draw, <laughs> and to be honest, it had split draw written all over it. Um, <laughs> what we saw was Dan Young brutalize sam alvey's face but somehow still get outstruck by sam alvey and i mean look if you're a fighter coming into the ufc who made Kadis abragimov look good at striking then you come out and fucking blam some poor gentleman and then you're getting outstruck by sam alvey i'm sorry it's a it's a double release here for me and i have nothing else to say on this fight so harry i'm really sorry if this comes across as disrespectful but every point that you made then, I disagreed with. Um, I thought it was complete and utter shit. Um, can you remember what I wrote down as my prediction for this fight? Do you have it? Do you have a copy of it anyway? Yeah, I, I, I left it blank. Cool, like, I left it I'll, blank because oh, yeah. it was such a ridiculous pick. It's all right. It's still etched in my own memory. So I can just go through everything I said again. I said, every so often, you'll get two guys that may not be the best, they may not be world championship caliber, but when they come together at the right time, the prelim card, something truly special happens that maybe world-class fighters couldn't emulate. And this was definitely one of those fights. Like me and my brother had a great time watching this from start to finish with Sam Alvey using his painted footwork um, and, you know, circling around the cage and, and everything else. Um, one thing I will stop. say for Sam Alvey that is like quite interesting, he's probably one of the only people, maybe Tyron Woodley like is another guy, who kind of makes it work, putting his own back to the fence, kind of makes it work. Um, I can't believe does, we've just had does Sam Alvey just, compared to Tyron fucking Woodley. Oh yeah, Tyron Woodley. <laughs> Um, but the way that it's, it's, I genuinely find it quite interesting. You'll get someone like Darren Young, you look at him, he's a better athlete. I mean, skills-wise, who knows? But let's say Ryan Spann, that's a better example, okay? Again, a much bigger guy, a better athlete. Um, and Sam Alvey's kind of weird, herky-jerky style where he just comes into the middle, backs himself all the way to the fence and just manages to counter with these right hooks until these guys that are pressing him there don't feel confident enough to commit to strikes and stuff. I do I do actually find it quite interesting, but um, I thought this was great fun, to be honest. Um, and I thought the split draw was what both guys deserve for just a, a valiant effort, basically. Um, okay, well, I'm glad you voiced your incorrect opinion and we'll move on to <laughs> one actually, actual brilliant fight, which was Casey Kenny and Nathaniel Wood. Now, now we'll talk about the fight and then we'll talk about some of the subsidiary stuff. But, but first of all, like, I loved this fight, but I also hated this fight. I hated this fight because you've got Nathaniel Wood, who's a prospect, and Casey Kenny, who's a prospect. And, and one of them took a loss here, right? And I really, really did not want to see one of them take a loss. I thought it would be really cool to, to have these guys fight in two, three, four, five fights time because you could be looking at two top five contenders here, frankly, in, in the future. And I just don't like having them fight so early on. However, what we did get to see was an absolute barn burner of a fight. If that didn't get, I, I don't know who got fight of the night honours, but if that didn't get fight of the night honours, I don't know what will, right? Like you can give Habib performance of the night. You can give Rob Whitaker performance of the night if you want, but fuck me, Casey Kenny and Nathaniel Wood was fight of the night for me. So the tale of this, this fight was, was Casey Kenny came out in the first round. Well, they both came out in the first round. So aggressive. Nathaniel was doing what he always does and landing really hard leg kicks. Casey did really well to eat them in the first round and he countered really well. I thought um, the first round was relatively easy to score for Casey Kenny. I then thought that round two, Kenny looked like uh, the leg kick started to total up a little bit. 
and 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 Nathaniel's own uh, head hunting and body work that started to, to total up a little bit. Had he slowed just a little bit in the second round, Nathaniel seemed to gain confidence from that and took round two. Round three for me was where it got really interesting. Um, and I personally scored it for Nathaniel Wood, but I need to go and watch it back again and 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 see exactly what happened. I thought that both guys landed big shots in round three and they both hurt each other in round three. I just felt like Nathaniel did a little bit more. Um, what what were your thoughts? Yeah, this was absolutely incredible. Um, incredible. And, and again, this comes with the, dis- the disclaimer that I'm going off memory here. Yeah, and with me a too. fight like me this too. where literally so much was happening every single second you know yeah, it's yeah, important yeah. that I'm really gonna have to go back and watch it as well um but yeah I thought it was amazing I feel like the main thing for me was just the volume and the output that both of these guys were keeping up it was like they were trying to literally counter everything that they yeah. were throwing at each other like you could see um Casey Kenny's like uh, body kick which obviously we saw Beautiful. against Haley Tang. Alatang Haley yeah Wow. Okay, I only changed the the order of the names, but um, but yeah, you saw that coming through. But then Nathaniel Wood was managing to counter that with leg kicks. Like Nathaniel Woods always had a really nice check hook. Like we've seen that in Cage Warriors and everything else. He's always had and um, really and really nice counter hook, and it was just amazing. I, I'm just um, I was saying to Connor, um, I was I was really really impressed when I watch a fight like this or a fight like. Justin Poirier versus Dan Hooker, that not only are these guys keeping that output up, but they're actually picking it up as the rounds go on. Like it's actually increasing. Like most people couldn't even do close to this if they were just hitting pads, never mind if they had Casey Kenny like running at them, you know? Mm. And I think Casey Kenny is really coming to his own as well the past couple of fights. And um, I agree with you, it is a bit of a, a prospect killer sort of matchup, um, which is, you know a little bit kind of sad, but I'm convinced these guys are going to carry on doing great things in their own weight class. In terms of the scoring, um, I scored the first round for Kenny. I feel like he he snowballed uh, towards the end of the round. The second round for Nathaniel Wood, um, I feel like like it was amazing, but Casey seemed to be fading a little bit and Nathaniel Wood managed to keep the same pace up. And then I gave round three... Um, to Kenny as well in the end with the with the grappling exchange, which I'm sure you know we'll get into now because yeah, that's yeah, yeah. a yeah. So so I I follow both Ben Cartledge and Sean Sheehan for any form of scoring and judging criteria. Sean has a really really good um, bit a bit of a YouTube video where he breaks down the rules, the new unified rules and he dissects what they mean and how the scoring is done and just very, very I'll, I'll link it to this, I'll put it in the show notes of this so everyone can see it um, and I'll also tweet it or whatever um, but the very, very primary method of scoring is based on damage impactful strikes, the ability to bring a fight to a close, right? So a really good relation to that would be Habib first round against Justin, right? He managed to take him down. He gets to mount. And then he throws up, he wanted an arm bar, but it ended up with like a bicep slice, like a weird bicep yeah. slice. And Justin's never going to tap to a bicep slice for six seconds left, <laughs> right? It doesn't matter. <laughs> but, but what we looked at is, okay, Jesus, like that's a very, very good attempt at finishing the fight. He manages to take him down, pass his guard and enter a submission attempt. Huge. Now, regardless of whether, you know, Habib had landed damage in, in the, the round, which he had, and Justin had obviously landed big leg kicks, which, which obviously scored. The reason why, in my opinion, Justin and um, Habib wins that first round, and again, I'd need to go and check MMA decisions to see what the guys had actually scored that first round. I would give it to Habib for coming closest to finishing the fight, right? So... The reason why I did not score the third round for Casey Kenny is because Kenny had uh, some back control, right? And he managed to take Nathaniel down. However, at no point did he actually take the back with two hooks in. At no point did he solidify his mat return into a dominant position, right? Nathaniel was always fighting to get back to his feet. There was very little time where Casey had proper control time and there was no damage landed, right? 
Whereas even in those grappling exchanges, Nathaniel hit Casey Kenny a couple of times. They weren't impactful strikes. They weren't going to be coming towards the end of the fight. But it shows you that there was damage coming backwards from Nathaniel Wood, which is why I didn't score the, the, the grappling as high as some of the shots that Nathaniel landed, the leg kicks, the straight right hands, the check hooks, as you talk about, some of the combinations near the end of the fight. Like, and this is not to say that it wasn't a close round because it was, because Casey Hen Kenny absolutely had his moments in that third round. You, his coach said to him at the end of the second round, he's like, look, you've got five minutes here. You have five minutes. This is a close fight. And Casey Kenny and Nathaniel would fought like it was a close fight. Um, I just scored it because I felt like the bigger shots, the bigger power shots were, were based on Nathaniel Wood. And I thought that, that the cumulative damage throughout the first and second round, and although the fights aren't scored based on cumulative damage, the, the, the piecing up of Casey Kenny's leg, essentially, to me, really slowed him down in that third round. He, wasn't, he had to switch stances a number of times. And I just felt like that forced my hand to, to give that third round to Nathaniel Wood in a 29-28 to Nathaniel Wood. But yeah, what did, what did you think? Yeah. So again, like you say, the third round was unbelievably close. Unbelievably um, and close. I actually edged the damage in strikes um, to Kenny. I, I have no argument bigger, against that either. Things. No but argument. again, it's like, you know, when it's that close, it's literally so subjective because they were, they were both cracking each other massive shots, you know, all yeah, the way through. 100%. Um, I think um, the grappling is an interesting sort of point to talk about, though, because I remember when we were going back and forth, when Casey Kenny got into that gut wrench position, like yep. the position you see Kamara Usman go to, yep. um, someone like Habib go to, any of the Dagestani guys, I immediately in my mind was like, okay, Kenny's got this round, okay? And it's kind of for two reasons. So number one... I thought it was interesting because I was actually writing you a message saying um, I think I'd given it Kenny for, you know, position as well because he's got mm -hmm. the gut wrench. But then I was thinking in my mind, by position, do they mean, you know, jujitsu progression where you're going side control, mount, you know, these conventional positions? or And because you were obviously talking about back control before, but these new wave of grapplers and wrestlers, there's a lot of them that will never take back back control. Yeah. Yeah. Like in theory, he could have put two hooks on Nathaniel Wood's back and Nathaniel Wood could have easily have bumped him over the top because it's MMA and people are very good at doing that. So the question is what constitutes a dominant grappling position now? And maybe that's just because we're in a sport that's very young and that gut wrench style of wrestling is still pretty recent. Like we'll get into Habib later on, but a lot of that style probably came with him and his dad. Like it's really that recent. Mm -hmm. Number two, and this doesn't necessarily say whether the judging was right or whether it was wrong. But I can tell you, thinking through a judge's eyes, so I've worked a little bit doing training as a judge, obviously on the smallest events you could possibly do it on. But I can tell you, when you're a judge sat in the seat and you're watching a fight like this in live time and you're like, oh my God, like this is so unbelievably close. Yep. You are frantically looking for anything clear to be the difference maker. Yes, yes. And I can tell you, as a judge, if I'd seen... Um, a takedown and he'd held that gut wrench because he got a decent enough bit of riding time into it like he killed Nathaniel's switch and stuff like that that was so, beautiful by the way that was beautiful yeah I love seeing stuff like that um, but yeah as a judge that doesn't say whether it was right or whether it was wrong but the minute I saw him go for the gut wrench I was like they're going to give him this round you know but like we both said <laughs> I'm going to have to watch this a few times and it may be one of those fights where you watch it over and over again, it could have gone to either guy. So the what I'm going to say here, really, is I've, I've checked MMA decisions. I checked MMA decisions almost instantly after the um, Kenny versus Wood fight finished. And of all of the media that scored it, um, only four people scored it for Nathaniel Wood. And I know these are media people, right? So, what you know, they're not judges. But I also look, and Ben Cartledge, Derek Cleary, and Dave Letherby, who are three of the biggest names in judging, all scored it for Casey Kenny, right? So, clearly, they saw something in there that I did not see. And what what is really interesting, however, is I'll just read the scorecards out to you. So, Ben Cartledge... 
amazing judge, incredible judge, scores the first round 10 9. Perfect. Scores the second round. Uh, sorry, 10 9 to Kenny, first round. Second round, 10 9 to Wood. Third round, 10 9 to Casey Kenny. Right. We then go Dave Cleary. Uh, sorry, Derek Cleary. 10 9 Kenny, first round. 10 9 Kenny, second round. 10 9 Wood, third round. And then Dave Letherby went 10 9 on all three on all three rounds to to uh, Casey Kenny. Now I can't agree with Dave Letherby's card personally, but again, this is a man that's been judging for 15 years plus. So clearly he's seen something in there that I have not seen, and that's the reason why he's awarded it. I don't actually have a problem really with the judging because as you say and as I've already said, they are super close rounds. And, and look, their cage side, we have an overview of the cage. Like it's a problem. Like that sort of thing is a problem. But um, I just thought it really interesting that, that both Ben Cartledge and Derek Cleary come out with a 10, nine, a uh, 29, 28 for Casey Kenny, but they award the rounds differently. Right. Like I, I, that, that just goes to show you just how close that fight was. Right. Um, but either way, look, uh, it's a shame that somebody had to lose that fight. Um, I hope that what happens is that both of their stock elevates based on that absolute incredible performance. But look, uh, both, both guys will be back and I'm really excited for both of them. Um, we'll move on now to, um, to title of us versus Stefan Struve. If you want to give me your thoughts on that fight, because I know you've got some absolutely brilliant insight. <laughs> yeah. Well, we were talking a little bit, um, you know, off air. One thing that tied to of us is really good at, um, I'm not sure whether this comes from like the fact that he's quite a good boxer or what it is, but He's very good at he'll land like a big strike, like an overhand right or a left hook. And instead of staying in that middle range where he could get hit with a counter, he'll usually crash all the way in to a position where he's got his head underneath the chin. He's got an underhook. He's got everything else. And it's a really nice way, even in, in his loss to Junior Dos Santos, it's a really nice way to land a big shot and then smother anything that's going to come as a counter towards him. Um <laughs> But going against Stefan Struve, which is something I've never, ever seen before, he essentially did the same thing, got to head position on Stefan Struve. <laughs> and Stefan Struve is so unbelievably tall that he literally just arched his neck and looked up towards the ceiling. And because his chin is so high up, he just, like, plucked off the head position and tied to a Vosset. And so, so, I mean, Ty was just what are you going to do? Left. Yeah, I know. Like, how can you even, like, respond to that? But, um, but yeah, I thought this was a lot, to be honest, of how I thought this was going to go. I still think there's questionable things maybe with Struve, um, whether his heart's in combat sports, you know, he, he's got a very sort of 50-50 record. And I think even though Ty has had a bit of a difficult run recently, I do think he's a fighter at heart. And I do think, you know, he still wants to compete because... Let's not forget, Stefan Struve has been at this for a long, long time. A um, long time. A long time compared to Ty Tuivasa. So, um, so yeah, this one wasn't too surprising for me, to be honest. I agree. I have very little to say on this fight. Um, we we all picked Ty Tuivasa. Uh, we all picked round two, TKO. Though, um, oh, sorry, sorry, that's not true. Jack picked Stefan Struve via round two submission so clearly oh, he knows yeah. fucking nothing about mma um but yeah look it is what it is uh yeah look i mean i'm glad that this was a real crossroads fight right that's what i wrote in my uh, in my breakdown on attack the back um and i said look one of these guys is probably going to get cut right and and it looks like it's probably going to be stefan struve right that i think that's now five fights four losses or six fights five losses one of the two um I'm glad that Taito Avasa won. I thought Taito Avasa was going to win. He's the younger fighter, less damage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I think actually the other thing that, that's really pivotal is probably his move to AKA, right? Now, we know that AKA guys are going to get injured a lot. They do really heavy sparring. But one thing they do have is really solid wrestling. And, and Taito Avasa obviously has heavy hands, obviously has good boxing. And adding that wrestling is probably something that, that's really going to help him. So um, yeah, props to Taito Avasa and... And if this is the last time we see Struve, obviously a guy that's had a great career and beat some incredible names in that sport, right? So, yeah. So we will move on to the most highly anticipated rematch, potentially of all time. 
definitely on is, this podcast. Definitely. And that is Iwan Kutalaba versus Magomed Ankalaev. And I mean, look, this went how the first fight should have gone, really. Do you know what I mean? It was yeah. Ankalaev just fucking mauling Iwan Kutalaba. And <laughs> my missus was, was watching tv at the same time that i was on right and i honestly jumped out of my seat and screamed like fuck me and she's like what and then she just saw that ian kutalaba was just laying on the floor motionless right like it was vicious the ko was absolutely vicious Do you yeah. want to talk to me about your thoughts of Manga and Goliath? yeah the the referee definitely wasn't leaving this one to chance you know no. in case i i almost putting in another crazy performance but yeah i think i agree with you the first fight seemed like just a bit of a glitch in the matrix like it shouldn't really have ever have happened and and it did but i i think um this probably went along the lines of what i expected i thought um i was doing well in the early going to be honest um but once magomed got to his range it just really shows how dangerous that guy is like oh you can God. see it if if you go and look his early, um through some of his earlier fights um you you can see how dangerous he is, especially as a counter striker. Um, like I can't remember what. So it was when he fought uh, Clidson and Brew. Um, this is another one of his performances where, when you watch it by itself, it was actually a, a very impressive performance. But he he did a similar thing where he slipped and countered and completely flattened Clidson's nose, like completely broke it in one strike. And because it wasn't like a TKO, people sort of forget about it. But this guy's really dangerous. Um, and I think, um, again, because of what we were talking about before, he's not like a, an English speaker and stuff like that. But I really think this he's one of the biggest prospects at 205 at the moment. And I think next for Magomed, it's just it has to be a big name. It has to be someone that will raise his stock that more casual fans know about because... I honestly think he's an absolute wrecking machine that nobody knows about. Hear me out. Okay. Johnny Walker. Oh. oh. See, that is a good bit of matchmaking. I like that. The issue is that I think that that kills Johnny Walker. Fuck I feel it. like that is Who the worst matchup in the world because this is how it's going to go. Johnny Walker is going to tap hands He's going to run across. He's going to throw that front kick like he always does. And he's going to get overhand righted into like another <laughs> another dimension. It's going to be terrible. And to be honest, I, I, still, I still... <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot because you're evil. Um, but <laughs> I still I still want to see uh, Johnny Walker versus Jury Prakaska. Even though, to be fair, I reckon that'll probably go a You mean way. Yuri Prashaka? Yeah. Um, yeah, not whatever what that, that name you just said. That, that was what, well, you know, it's pronounced differently. Um, right. Yeah, right. yeah. But yeah, so, oh, I don't know. Johnny Walker could be good. Um, I'm trying to think of like another name they could put him against. All right, like, here's my second people. choice. Yeah. Sam Alvey. Just hear me out. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that to smiling, <laughs> Sam. Plus, how sad would you be? If Magomed goes to the middle as a counter striker and gets and Sam tap bumps <laughs> and slowly walks his own back to the cage, that's going to destroy Magomed's like whole mindset. No, you mate, Magomed's that. just going to go in and just destroy him. No, he won't. He'll get caught with a right hook. I'm telling you, oh, Sam's going to hit him with that team quest. No, it's going to be no impossible. Be impossible. Um, yeah, yeah, come on, let's I have did... some fun. Just give me Johnny Walker. Come on. All right, Johnny Walker could be cool. Um, even though you're essentially just executing him, yeah. Fucking, um, fucking. Or d -d 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 who else could you do? OSP, maybe. I'd be into that. Um, I, I think, think that'd be what a you good could do, guy. like to be honest, is I know that uh, that Johnny Walker lost to him. Uh, sorry, beat him. But Ryan Span would be a good test. Yeah, I'd like Ryan Span. Like, no, no jokes aside. Like. I mean, fuck Johnny Walker as well. Like, I'd like, like to see him get blamed by Magomed. But, but you know, I think Ryan Spann is a good athlete. He's got heavy hands. He's, he's you know, he's got a decent wrestling game. Like, I think that would be nice. It'd be a nice fight. Like, I think the Kutalaba fight, yeah, cool. Clearly, Kutalaba was outmatched. Fine. Um, let's do Ryan Spann and then let's do, let's do a big fight. Let's do a big fight. Yeah, I'd like that. I'd like that. 
All right. So we'll move on to my absolutely dismal performance against uh, Lauren Murphy. I mean, look, I spoke to Lauren in in the back before we went out and had a quick match. And she said that she had an absolute fire promo to cut after this matchup. So I was like, look, look, what, what do you want me to do? Like, how could I stand in the way of true greatness? And I didn't. Do you know what I mean? I said to I her, like, whether you... I said to her, look, I was like, I've got really good outside heel hooks, right? So if you could let me show that off, I'd be really, really happy. And she was a bit of a dick and she didn't let me show me. But look, it is what it is. I went out there. I decided to throw 100% power with absolutely every shot, almost every single shot I hit the air with. But look, I showed I had great hand speed. I showed that my wrestling was supposedly really good, but looked trash. And it looked like I fought someone that was 30 pounds heavier than me and it was also really good. So... For my first UFC debut, I'm not really sure what more you can ask of me, to be honest. You put in a really brave showing, Harry. I'll give you that. Um, Thanks, mate. Oh, my God. I at least tried to peel the hands off the rear naked once. Just once. I tried. What what more do you want? Oh, you you know, I actually think the saddest thing about this one was I went into this with unbelievably low expectations. And then the commentary team actually rose my expectations, which I suppose is what they're there for. But... When they were talking about Lilia Shakarova and they said that she was a champion, master of sport in wrestling, master of sport, everything yeah. else, she won all the trials and the only reason she got kicked out was she punched someone or something like that. Hilarious. I was like, this could be really, really cool. Like we could see if she gets into a grappling exchange, this could be really cool. And then she shot a low ankle, <laughs> a low ankle single leg, like in MMA, in, in the center of the cage. And I was like, oh God. No. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be really bad. I, I messaged this is the chat. This actually going to be terrible. <laughs> with the most ironic message. And I was like, cool, low single entry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and as much as you were being ironic, it still really annoyed me <laughs> just reading that. <laughs> like, it's, oh man, I was so frustrated with this one. I think this is just another classic example of someone that like has come from pure freestyle wrestling and just tried to jump in, you know, in MMA. And, I thought Lauren Murphy, she did what she had to do. You know, she did a good job. She shut it down um, in a very sort of MMA grappling sort of way and managed to sub her. But yeah, the promo afterwards, I mean, geez, like... Phenomenal. It just shows the sort of... <laughs> no, not phenomenal. Absolutely Mate, terrible. Like, how can you not like... Who... She stood in the middle of the cage after absolutely dominating... An undefeated, <laughs> phenomenal prospect. Uh, not undefeated. An absolutely phenomenal prospect in Lilia Shakarova. <laughs> no, not even undefeated. Shakarova was brought in, right? And Laura Murphy was thrown to her like a wolf. A piece of meat to a wolf. And Lauren managed to, to dominate her. We saw some beautiful McGregor elbows. The grappling exchange was beautiful. I'd even argue that against the fence, Lauren did so well to turn that fight around and dominate the grappling. Then she gets her own takedown, takes the back. Beautiful. You saw Lauren grow in confidence when she realized she had more power and she was better in the striking realm. She was walking her down. Mate, it was absolutely brilliant. And then at the end... She, she pushes John Anik to the side. She pulls out a PowerPoint presentation and she gives the promo of her fucking life. And you're here slating that. You don't deserve to be an MMA fan. I'm sorry. Harry, this is just another moment during the podcast where I don't know whether you're trying to be humorous or if you're trying to, to make people laugh at this, but you're actually just making me more annoyed. Like, just, I'm just being that genuine. Promo, I had a friend who, you know, maybe shall remain nameless who literally messaged me halfway through that speech just saying, when will this end? <laughs> like, he, like, he was just suffering that much. Listen to Lauren Murphy, who, this isn't a knock. Okay, Lauren Murphy, she, she's good. She is good. But she's just beat a debutant who has no reputation for really doing anything apart from punching someone at the Olympic trials, which is kind of cool, to be fair. But has no proper reputation and then acted as if, you know, she's the next number one contender in this, like all the opponents I had. I thought <laughs> the PowerPoint presentation thing you said is like such a good comparison because it was literally like she was reading off the bullet pointed list that she like prepared in the back. Like uh, everyone uh, I fought was ranked. Uh, they were all, um, they were all professional prize fighters, I think. Um, so therefore, you should put me in line for a title shot. And it's just like, 
oh, I'm just not not invested in that at all. But I mean, it happens in these shallow divisions, doesn't it? Look, at the end of the day, the problem you have is that Laura Murphy came with hard facts and you just can't handle the truth. <laughs> I can't handle you can't, can't handle the truth. I can't That's correct. Like, I can't. I really Look, can't. I, as as much as oh. I, I adored Laura Murphy's promo and I, I sat riveted to my chair watching it as I took my headphones off and went to get a glass of water. Um, <laughs> at the end of the day, like legitimately, she kind of does have a shout for a title shot, to be honest, because, you know, she's strong like four wins together. She's finished two of those fights. That doesn't happen too much in that division. Valentina's fighting Jennifer Meyer soon. Clearly, Valentina's just going to run through Jen- Jennifer Meyer. And then who is that? Like Calvillo needs probably a couple of wins in, in, in order to stake her claim. Laura Murphy probably has a shout at that, at, at that fight, right? And look, if nothing else, Dana loves promos and that was the best promo of 2020. I honestly can't even bear it. The more you, you promote what she came out with. But the sad thing is you're right, you know, um, not about the promo, but about how... Right. Um, she she could fight for a title. I mean, it completely makes sense. I mean, she stole the strange bit of hype that Roxanne um, sort of took when she fought um, to do Macy Barber. Yeah. Um, yeah, she stole a good bit of hype, even though, again, even that came as like Macy Barber seemed to slip on a banana skin in the middle of the octagon. So... Uh, you're right. That sounds like it a just promo speaks to, me. to yeah. It just I just can't wait for the countdown show when it goes in. They're having to look at people Rox- Roxanne Modafferi defeated to kind of build up a case of why Lauren Murphy could be dangerous. Me, me and Connor are actually talking about how loads of um, the girls that are putting forward to title shots, they're actually marketing the title shot just on how little of a chance they have against champions like Amanda Nunes, Shevchenko, everyone else. It's, it's basically like, imagine if you missed the chance to see something come true that is so unrealistic. Imagine how sad you'd feel if you saw the impossible happen live on air. Have, you, um, like, have you seen yeah. that Amanda Nunes has been booked for a fight? Uh, no, I've not. Who against? Megan Anderson. Megan oh. Anderson, sorry. Megan, uh, Look, I feel like we all we all knew that was going to happen. But... At the end of the day, mate, how many yeah. people have finished Katz and Garno by a toe in the eye? That is your next champion, <laughs> right there. You are on the UFC PR team. Are you? Are you all... the one that goes to the countdown shows and give, gives Look, that guy with a really cool voice? Though? All I'm saying, right, is if Laura Murphy wanted another job, President 2020, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> Wow. And you, you call me a shill, Harry. I'm absolutely disgusted at you. You are right. the person I thought you were. Let's move on to uh, yeah. Phil Horse <laughs> and Jacob Malcolm because clearly we've just yeah. seen the rise of the new 125-pound <laughs> champion. Um, so this, literally, there's not much to talk about. Phil Horse just went in there and absolutely fucking railroaded this poor gentleman in 18 seconds, and it was absolutely disgusting. Uh, but look, um, I think, actually... All I have to say is uh, is what Jack said. Jack, before this podcast, unfortunately, isn't av- available to join us. Um, clearly, he'd agree with me that Lauren Murphy's promo was phenomenal. But um, his point was... Don't use Jack like that. The Jacob Malcolm fight was sad. And I think probably that's the best way to put it. And actually, Jack would use you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I agree. I don't think that... Um, I don't know whether this was actually Robert Whittaker getting him into the UFC. I hope but not. yeah, Robert Whittaker is an amazing fighter. But if he was the talent scout, that just doesn't really seem like the route to go. But well, I actually, think, Sean, um, can I just pull you up on something very quickly here? Yeah. So please. you've just given it all this beans about how, you know, whatever. We hope it's not this match. Can we just draw you to, a, to your pick for this fight? Oh no! What has Pass Sean done? What has he done? Pass Sean has picked Hawes by unanimous decision. Oh yeah, no, you're right. I got the I got the time frame pretty wrong. Me and I Jack think... went for a Hawes round one certified whacking, and Sean was like, "I reckon, lads, what we're going to see here <laughs> Quite is a doubt. unanimous decision." <laughs> yeah. Oh god. No, that was. Um, I'm glad that we can get to Habib later on, and this is going to redeem me a lot. But that was, that, even by Jesus. my standards, that was a pretty shocking, shocking pick. Um, but yeah, I thought this one was literally just the case of someone that 
has learnt those difficult lessons already in Phil Hawes. Um, just taking out someone who it's really hard to tell how good Jacob Malkoon is. Like he, he could be really decent and he was yep. just caught with UFC jitters by someone that's Absolutely. learnt those lessons. But who knows? It'll be interesting to see what Phil Hawes does and it's good to see him um, get you know, closer to that big prospect or the PPA Look, I mean, ago. to be honest, I think he is that big prospect, really. Like, there's been bountiful conversations from when he was at Jackson Wink saying that, oh, he's the next John Jones, he's the next this, he's the next that, right? Now, he was pushed quickly, right? His contender series fight against uh, Julian Marquez, obviously it's the viral KO. It's not great to be on the end of, that's fine. But what we saw here, in my opinion, is in the 18 seconds, we didn't get to see much. But what I did see is that he came out, he pressed Malkoon immediately. He cut off the cage really well. And Malkoon literally looked like a deer in the headlights, like, fuck me, I can't go left here. I can't go right here. What do I do, right? Mm. And what, what happened was, as you say, he got caught with a massive shot and put away. And, and as you also say, who knows? Like, Malkoon was, geez, that was only his fifth professional fight, right? Like... As you say, we could be looking at a Phil Hawes here who's really ready to show everything he's learned outside of the regionals. And we could be looking at a, an, an Uber prospect here. Like, I, in my opinion, he is a prospect, but whether he's an Uber prospect is, is still to be seen. But but I feel for Jacob Malkoon. I think I echo Jack's statements that it was sad. It was sad to see somebody that was clearly on a very, very different level that day go in there and, and, and do that, you know. But look, this is MMA and sometimes these things do happen. And, and, you know, sometimes we do see that fighters open the door for, for lesser known fighters to come in and, and get spots on a card. Hopefully Jacob Malkoon is fine and, and he recovers from this well. And yeah, we see him again. Definitely. That, that, that's probably the best outcome we could see from this. Yeah. Um, so let's turn on to Volkov versus Walt Harris. Like for me, honestly, this was amazing from, from Volkov. This was absolutely phenomenal. Like, on the commentary, they made a really interesting point about how this is probably what's going to happen when Volkov doesn't care about takedowns. And I think that's actually a really, really, really good pick, a really good observation, a really good read. It was almost like a Dominic Cruz-esque level of <laughs> cerebral picking by who I thought DC was trash throughout the commentary, but whatever. Um, what Volkov did in this fight, essentially, is just fought at range. And, and whenever Walt came in for a big shot, Volkov landed three. And it was just beautiful. It was beautiful to watch. And a really, really good call by the ref at the very end of, the, of, that, uh, of that sequence where he caught him with a, so, uh, a front kick to the solar plexus. It looked, from, from the angle that the TV broadcast had it on, it looked like it was a low kick, but the referee was in a perfect position to see it. And it's not often that you see a fighter scream in pain essentially we've seen it in the last two cards we saw it with uh, caitlin chukagian when she got caught by that body shot against andrage and we saw it here with with walt harris like you know these fighters have got amazing poker faces and for for something to hurt that much they literally scream in agony and drop my mm. god it must be painful um and i don't have you ever been caught with a solar plexus kick yeah, really, yeah. If you, yeah, yeah and punches disgusting. to the solar plexus as well. Yeah. I mean, do you Horrible. remember? Do you remember um, Merced Bektik versus? Oh, I can't remember. I can't. I'm, I'm going to need to this, pull it is up. This, this is like early Merced Bektik. This is early Merced Bektik. Yeah, and he like really the guy decent. with a solar plexus. Um, oh, Jesus. I'm going to need to look it up. It's Godofredo Pepe. I've just remembered without Googling it. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Godofredo Pepe. He destroyed him with a solar plexus punch. It was a jab, I believe, or maybe it was a right hand, but he dropped it and, and Godofredo Pepe just collapsed into the cage. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And that's not just like, obviously, Merced Bectic is, has, has lots and lots of power, but it just collapses your entire body, mm. right? It's just nuts. Um, and to see, uh, to see, and we, I mean, look, Volkov's what, six foot 11, massive legs, massive legs to get hit with that. Oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Phenomenal. But um, I'm really impressed by Volkov. Really, really impressed with Volkov. I think it looks like if he doesn't, as you, as we've already stated, if he doesn't have to worry about the takedown, he's a serious, serious prospect. Now look against Curtis Blades, Curtis Blades just did everything he needs to do to take him down and win. Right. And, and, and that is what it is. But, 
he he dominated for Doom. He dominated Stefan Struve. He dominated uh, Derek Lewis for four minutes and 48 seconds. And then he got blammed by a massive overhand, right? He did. I thought he did well enough against Greg Hardy. So in his last five fights, really, he's he's done exceptionally well. And obviously he lost two of them. Uh, but But yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I was the same. This was one of the most surprising uh, on the whole card for me, to be honest, in terms of how I saw it going in. Mm -hmm. Um, Like I said to you guys, I thought that Walt Harris was really going to have a big advantage in that middle range um, with his sort of boxing background. First round, okay, yeah. So obviously that one. Did (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, thanks, Walt. Um, (laughs) There were a couple of things that were really good. Like, obviously... A big thing we always talk about in open stance matchups is getting that outside foot position. And usually when you see really good boxers um, against kickboxers, you'll see that the kickboxer really struggles to win that outside foot position on them. But Volkov just won it every time. And you could see that it was really nullifying the options that Walt had on the counter. Because I think at heart, Walt is a counter striker. But um, against Volkov, the most impressive thing was that even in the boxing range, he was just absolutely tuning him up, you know, in the vast majority of the exchanges. And I think Walt Harris was putting a brave face on it and trying to get through. But like you say, I think the um, Caitlin Shikagan comparison is really, really solid. Like uh, the reaction was almost identical. And for anyone that's ever been hit, I usually find that the liver um, really like shuts the body down. So you'll usually collapse. The issue with the solar plexus is, a lot of the time you can actually stay standing for a while, but it's like you get winded. So the harder you get struck there when you're not expecting it, the longer a period of time it is until you can actually breathe again. That's why you get this thing with Shikagan where she's still stood up, but she's trying to get as much distance between her and Andrade as she possibly can. The same way as Walt Harris didn't go straight down immediately. He tried to get back as much as he could. But if you can't breathe, you just can't fight. You know, you've got some guys that can hide it, you know, a little bit better. But if you get hit with a certain shot with a certain amount of power, there's just no hiding that. So it's another tough one for Walt Harris. Um, I imagine for him, it's probably, I don't know what camp he comes out of, but it's probably another one where he goes back to the drawing board. It seems to be that grapplers and kickboxers are something that are giving him problems. Like he has good boxing. We've spoken about that, but Guys that can mix the kicks up as well, like we've seen with Volkov and Overeem, seem to give him problems. I would actually love to see Walt Harris go to um, Hard Knocks, do a bit of training with Henry Hooft. Um, I think that would be a really good guy to sort of um, tie up those holes that he has. Um, But yeah, so impressed by Volkov in this one. And I think going forward, if he gets put in another striker against striking matchup, I'll definitely be giving him a lot more respect. Yeah, I mean, he called out Overeem. I like that matchup. That would be a fun matchup. Yeah. Really um, although good. Overeem's wrestling is underrated, um, I, he, I'd he i like to see him against JDS. That'd mm. be a lot of fun. Mm. Um, but yeah, look, uh, I think Volkov is probably going to stick around long enough to get a title shot, to be honest. Yeah. Um, he's probably going to fight in Garnu and probably get blammed. Um, <laughs> but yeah. look, these things happen. Um, yeah, <laughs> we'll move on to the co main event, which uh, I believe all of us got the pick wrong. No, no, Sean, you got the pick correct. Oh, you there you, you go. Did. See, so I, I mean, to be honest, I nearly had my pick come to fruition in the last 30 seconds, right? I, uh, I called Cannoneer third round to TKO. Um, I was unbelievably impressed with Robert Whittaker here. And and I think I'm just going to echo Jack's statement as well. So Jack said, (laughs) we were so wrong to to fade Bobby Knuckles out. And we should have considered the fact that he absorbed damage and recovered really well in the, in the Darren Till fight. And the fact that he only had a three month turnaround, which is a clear sign. He's in a good place mentally and physically after the Till fight. And I think that that's an absolutely brilliant, succinct thought on, on Robert Whittaker coming in here. I thought, um, at the very, very start, I thought that Rob was in for a tough three rounds. Jarrod Kananir ran to the center of the octagon and destroyed that front leg with an absolutely monstrous leg kick. And those leg kicks turned out to be less prevalent than we could ever imagine because Kananir kept battering it like a baseball bat on a piece of wood. And Whittaker just kept bouncing on it and kept throwing forward. And and my God, I thought, I thought Whittaker looked... How should I say this? I mean, 
to me, it, it, it's now even more plainly obvious than before that Robert Whittaker is the second best middleweight in the world by a country mile. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I was, I was really impressed with this one. Um, can we just point out as well that when Jack says we got it wrong, he is referring to himself and you got that's it wrong. Correct, yeah. Obviously, that's correct. This guy got it right, but um, to be For fair, the I think they were. <laughs> I think they were fair picks because. I think there is a big question for Robert Whittaker. And for me going in, I think we all would have said without the sort of backlog that he has of these tricky fights and how long he's been fighting now, um, Robert Whittaker would beat Jared Cannonier nine times out of 10. I think we all would have said that. Um, but yeah, I was unbelievably impressed. I think the big difference maker um, for me in this one was Robert Whittaker was surprisingly a lot faster than Jared Cannonier. Yeah. Um, especially with that bounce. I think it really showed, um, again, the sort of trade-off that you get with that karate stance where you may get more kicks to the front leg coming in and out, but the actual speed you can jump in and out with and the way that Robert Whittaker carries that left hand really low. Like people have said in boxing for ages, you can usually um, land the job, the job, the jab a lot more. Jesus Christ. Um, <laughs> because it's lower and it's out of the person's field of vision. Um, and I've certainly found from sparring that, that that's the thing as well, sort of carrying that front hand low. Uh, one thing I'll say for Robert Whittaker as well is he probably has one of the most durable front legs in the entire sport, which if you think of like the Yoel Romero fight, because I only just remembered at the start, obviously the whole thing of Yoel like Stamping completely on hyperextending it. Yeah. Robert Whittaker is still good to go. He's still bouncing and everything else. So, for anyone coming in with a leg kick in the future, I'll be like, look, he's just got a different front leg. <laughs> you know, It's a really weird sort of intangible. Um, but I think Jared Cannonier struggled because um, he has the opposite sort of stance. He's very like, he stays planted um, in that, you know, tie boxing stance. He can't move as much. And it reminded me a bit of the problems that he had with Dominic Reyes, where again, you've got another guy who, is a lot longer, plays from like a distance and everything else. And it really seemed like he was struggling to get it going. And just one more thing, because I, I really, really love this fight, but that combination that Robert Whittaker has, where yeah. he'll basically yeah, yeah, start yeah. off dinging you with that straight right hand. And the more that you slip to get out of the way, he'll come up with that uh, head kick that comes straight after it. Yeah. It takes a lot of flexibility to do. But he's completely destroyed, like, maybe four guys in it during his run. Like, I know Derek Bronson and Jack Ray were both on that list, but what a technique it is that, that he keeps using there. But, yeah, I thought it was a great performance and another feel-good one as well because I'm a massive fan of who Robert Whisker is outside of the cage as well as inside the cage. He just seems like the most happy-go-lucky bloke yeah. that happens to be one of the most dangerous men in the world as well. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it was great. It was really good. I mean, I, I actually felt quite sad about this one um, because I didn't want either gentleman to lose. Uh, I, I think the Jarrah Cannonier story is a brilliant one, coming in at heavyweight, essentially reevaluating his entire life, coming down two weight classes, and then going on an absolute tear, right, and looking like a killer doing it. But I think you made an absolutely brilliant point. You essentially took all of my points, and, and that was that Robert Whittaker won this essentially entirely on footwork. Because what we saw was Cannoneer could never set his feet in the right direction in order to catch Whitaker. Whitaker was always in or out. And if he was out, he was at an angle. If he was in, he was in his face and he was getting hit, essentially. Um, and that beautiful, you know, he throws that, he dives in with that jab. The right hand is almost like a, a fade away and he's already leaning to that left-hand side to throw that high uh. kick, right? So it's like, pick your poison. Either get clipped with the right hand and block the kick or block the right hand, slip the right hand and get hit with the kick. Like, it's really yeah. up to you. Um, and and yeah, I thought that was uh, beautiful by Whitaker. It's something, it's like his signature move at this point, right? You, yeah. He just jabs people, p brings his special power bar up to the top, and then blam, <laughs> you hit your combination yeah. on the keypad and off it goes. Like, yeah, yeah I, I was really impressed with Whitaker. I, I still think, was it you? No, it wasn't you. I think it was somebody else that said to me while we were watching, like, oh, uh, I could see this Whitaker beating Izzy. I doubt it. And the reason I doubt it is because Izzy is the master of footwork and Whitaker can bounce in and bounce out, but Izzy is never going to be there, right? And 
And although, you know, I, I really, I don't, I shouldn't be saying this because we should be celebrating Robert Whittaker. I, I don't think that that title shot comes anytime sooner because what we're going to see, in my opinion, as Izzy just grows and grows and grows in his skill set is Izzy's just not going to be there when Rob does bounce in. But yeah, everything you said, the speed was so impressive from Whitaker, the damage, everything, his toughness, his durability was so, so impressive. In the last 30 seconds, Whitaker, uh, Jared Cannonier caught him, had him wobbled. And you're like, oh shit, here we go. But Rob just, you know, gutted it out, realized there's only 30 seconds left and did what he needed to do. Phenomenal. Um, so let's move on to one of the, oh man, I don't, I don't even know how to frame this, to be honest. Like arguably one of the greatest UFC title defenses we've ever seen. Um, and let's just set this up with, with what we now, now know after the fight. Right. So we now know that Habib was planning on retirement after this fight. We know that um, there was a foot injury that has been touted that it's a broken foot. Uh, Javier Mendez has come out and said it was a broken toe. Um, and that's what the tape was for. But still, um, multiple members of Habib's camp got a really bad staff infection. We know that because Umar, uh, Umar Nurmagomedov was taken off the card with the staff infection after being hospitalized. Habib had the mumps two weeks into camp. So a serious illness, he's then recovered, he then breaks a toe, serious problem. You know, in a six-week camp, eight-week camp, to have four weeks of that out with a broken foot, essentially, a broken toe, and a really bad illness is not great, right? And you would not fucking believe it if you saw Habib, that performance, right? So I just want to, again, just slightly preface this before I let you let you go full ball. Um Two of the three judges scored that round for Justin Gaethje, right? And and this sort of brings into contention my thoughts about being close to finishing a fight. So obviously at the start of this, I said about Habib was closer to finishing the fight with the takedown, the guard pass, the mount, and the submission attempt. But clearly, Ben Cartledge and Sal Amato have both scored that for Justin Gaethje. And again, I, I point to Ben Cartledge as a real, real empirical member of uh, man of knowledge when it comes to judging. So I guess what he's done here is he's looked at uh, Gaethje's counter overhands and counter hooks and those massive leg kicks. And he's, he's scored that based on damage. Um, but Sean, break me, break me, down, the, break me down the fight, uh, you know, all two rounds of it and, and tell me what you think. Yeah, I think um, just from what you were saying, like the atmosphere going into this one, oh the God. only other person I think I've been this emotionally invested in, this may even be more, is like some of um, Connor's early fights. You know, I can't remember being this nervous watching a fight before because of all the storylines going in. Um, and yeah, I think actually Jack made a good point before about Habib going in in terms of, um, he's probably one of the mentally strongest athletes in the sport, which is interesting when you consider that Justin Gaethje, a lot of his um, sort of talk going in was the idea of, I've been in these firefights, Habib chooses to shut everything down that a person's doing and take everything away from them. Therefore, Habib's not as used to adversity or whatever. And I think Habib just has that mentality no matter what, because especially after everything you just said in terms of what he went through to get there, you, you wouldn't have thought it. And the minute he was in there, it seemed like just the way he was actually pressuring Gaethje was really interesting. Um, I suppose from a technical perspective, one point that I think Charles Sonnen made that was really good was that for Justin Gaethje to avoid the takedown of Habib, he also had to change one of the things that he's best at as a fighter. Um, in other words, he couldn't come forward and put the pressure on Habib. He had to be evasive and stay back, which meant that for a while, it was like Justin Gaethje couldn't really get his offense off in the same mm -hmm. way that he usually does, mm -hmm. um, which I thought was a really good point. And I just thought it was crazy when it reached a point in one of the rounds where I was like, this is like Habib versus Edson Barbosa again, mm -hmm. where you've got this phenomenal striker. But one thing people don't talk about with Habib enough is how functional his striking is with the grappling yep. and the grappling threat he poses because he was just walking Gaethje down. He didn't really seem to have a care in the world. And even from his early fights, Habib's always been really good at having that reckless striking to close the distance, you know, because obviously in combat, Sambo, he's always struck. So he's always had like a serviceable 
level of striking to go along with his grappling to keep him safe. Like he knows how to strike, but that was a surprise for me just how on the feet, I think he still looked comfortable outside the low kicks. I agree. And I think something that all three of us really, really, really neglected is the effect of the Habib pressure on what Justin was going to do. Like the, what I looked at really was I was like, okay, Justin may just come forward with reckless abandon and land those superior strikes and force Habib back. Because what, what do you need to beat Habib? You need to be able to push him back. You need to be able to stuff the takedown and you need confidence, right? Justin didn't have the confidence. He was able to stuff the wrestling for the most, for the most part, right? And he had the superior striking, but he didn't come forward with reckless abandon. It felt like the game plan for Justin was, we're going to make sure we stuff those takedowns, which he did really, really well for, you know, like, let me, let me put you, I, again, this was a, an analogy that, that was made on the, the Sean Sheehan podcast, the Severe MMA podcast was, if I'd have told you, Sean, that the first round of Habib and Gaethje was completely standing for four minutes 30, Justin stuffed numerous amounts of takedowns and forced Habib to stand and strike with him, Habib managed to get a takedown in the last 30 seconds, but essentially did nothing with it other than, you know, he, he mounted and, and got, the, got, got the, the, the bicep slicer. How would you have imagined that to go? You'd imagine what? Well, you'd imagine that Gaethje was absolutely tuning him up on the feet the whole time that they were there right. and that he got like a desperation right. takedown, wouldn't you? Right. And what happened was essentially the, the opposite. Yeah. Like, I felt like Justin Gaethje had his moments incredibly heavy low kicks which was you know what we expected habib wasn't able to turn those low kicks into takedowns which we also expected but what we didn't expect or maybe what we didn't anticipate was justin's fear of the takedown or awareness of the takedown you know look at justin's stance he stood six inches lower than he usually does which means the power isn't in his legs to throw he was waiting to counter Habib and Habib was more than willing to come on in and land that, that beautiful left uppercut slash jab that he's got. If anyone wants a deep dive on that, go and look at Dan Hardy's war room before this fight. And he goes into real detail about that, that sort of uppercut jab that Habib has that almost mm. looks like a hook when it finishes, but it starts as an uppercut, but he actually uses it as a jab, right? Like you were talking about serviceable striking. You know, you don't teach a, a day one boxer to throw... No a shot that lands like a hook, starts like an uppercut, but it's actually a jab, right? Like you don't teach them that. But then Habib had this beautiful straight right hand and, and landed it on just a number of times, led just, left Justin bleeding with that right hand. And then look, in the second round, when it hit the mat, my God, my God, was it beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And I think that brings us on to a really interesting question about Justin Gaethje's grappling. Um, cause I think part of that was the problem in terms of why Justin was so much more aware and so much urgent, uh, felt so much more urgency to keep this on the feet. I think that in terms of Gaethje shutting down the clinch exchanges immediately, that was really impressive. Like, I was yeah, actually worried there for a moment because I was like, that is perfect. Like Habib was shooting on the legs. If he came up for an underhook, like Gaethje would just shut that down immediately, disengage. Fantastic. But I think the issue is and Luke Thomas has brought this up as a rumour quite a lot. And when you watch this fight, you can believe it's true. There is a sort of rumour that when Justin Gaethje trains, he doesn't really train jiu-jitsu, like, um, like barely at all, really. Like, apparently he trains almost completely striking. And I imagine some takedown defence with that. But what it meant was when Habib did get those first takedowns, you could see it was like someone that was in jiu-jitsu so many ranks higher because one thing that's really good about Habib's game is he, it, he has it um, split up into different sort of steps and sections according to what guys' defences are going to be. So say someone like Conor McGregor or Dustin Poirier, those guys are, are legit um, at jiu-jitsu. So when they get taken down, they're going to they're gonna have a game straight away to get back up, to not concede position, to not get past then you'll go up to the stuff up against the fence where Habib starts triangling the legs. And the point is, he has a pretty comprehensive system based on all of those responses. The difference with Gaethje, when he did get the takedown on him, was Gaethje didn't have those steps to delay Khabib from getting from step one 
to step 10 when he's mm-hmm. in Mount and he's put mm-hmm. in here. Because say with Conor McGregor, it took him about four, not four rounds, sorry, but it took him until the fourth round until he was at that killing stage of his game where mm-hmm. Conor's shoulders are flat, he's smashing him, he's getting to positions like Mount and he's doing like real, real bits of damage. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. For Gaethje, that first takedown that landed, Habib was already there. He was at step 10 straight away. Mm-hmm. And I think that speaks to one issue if you don't train your grappling and your jiu-jitsu just in just didn't have those defenses in place for when the fight hit the mat he may have been very good at disengaging from the clinch which you'd imagine as a wrestler but i can believe to be honest that room is true that he doesn't train a great deal off his back um, and I, from that i don't mean he, he should train rubber guard i mean training get-ups training how to keep the inside space so Khabib just doesn't take everything away from you all that sort of stuff and I think having that in the back of his mind probably made him a lot more scared on the feet as well to be honest I agree like this reminded me a little bit of I know this is a little bit obscure but do you remember Galor Bufando versus Chad Laprise in the UFC yeah yeah so what happened in yeah that I do fight I, I actually Lepri- sorry yeah Chad Lepree got the takedown and literally just fell into Mount. Like he didn't have to do anything, essentially. And Habib was the same. In the first takedown, he triangled the legs. Justin brought his legs, his knees up. And Habib just stepped over his knees. There was no defensive capability whatsoever. There was no overhook. There was no framing. There was no under, there was no butterflies. There was nothing. He just stepped over. And to me, I thought like, okay, I wonder whether, because Justin had actually got his hips to the back, to the fence, right? So I was like, all right, cool. His hips are to the fence. And then Habib just stepped into mountain. I was like, oh no. Oh, that's not good. Like, that's not good at all. And then to be in mount against Habib is the one place you just don't want to be other than half guard, right? Bottom half guard. But but the ability, how how quickly Habib went to set up that arm bar and Justin just didn't seem to have anything to stop that. And then when Habib got the second takedown, I remember saying to myself, like, this is over. Like this is yeah. over. Cause there was plenty of time to work. And the setup that Habib had is actually very similar to the first triangle choke he ever finished in MMA, which was his debut, which <laughs> was just so beautiful and just so, so serendipitous to finish the, his career in exactly the same way that he started. <laughs> yeah. right? He traps yeah. the arm, he sets up an arm bar and he goes to the triangle. And again, as with all good triangles, you're, you're offering two ways out. You're either going to snap someone's arm or you're going to choke them with a triangle. Right. And Habib, chose the triangle he cut the angle beautifully well and oh yeah just absolutely absolutely beautiful jiu-jitsu because because that was another thing i was thinking as well and just to piggyback on what you just said but when in the first round um habib was going for that arm bar i was like that's quite uncharacteristic of habib to be going to a position where he's sitting his own hips to the mat and where he could potentially end up on his back but then i was like you know fair enough he he has 10 seconds left He's probably just trying to get up on the scorecards, just like you were saying with that criteria before. But then when he did the same thing with four minutes left in the round, I was like, this is this is really weird. And to me, what that spelled out, which um, you'll know, you obviously train jiu-jitsu and, and everything else, but there'll be certain people you train with where there is that level difference. Mm-hmm. You'll feel immediately like you can go for other things. Whereas mm-hmm. if you go against someone that's really strong or really good, mm-hmm. your game and your options limits down to your A game. And I feel like when Habib was against Poirier and Connor, because they both have really good sort of gets up games, yeah. he was like, I am only going to go for one of these rear nakeds where I'm literally stood on top of them. I'm not even going to put hooks in, you know? But when he went for that triangle and literally sat to his back, I was like, he must just feel something out there that there's no way. Because Justin Gaethje's finished a few people by slamming them out of triangles. But obviously Habib in there felt there was a huge difference, which, um, you know, may again uh, sort of support the idea that Gaethje doesn't do a whole lot of jujitsu. I think, though, to be fair to both Gaethje and Habib, Habib had pressed him against defense before he even sat for the, the, the triangle. 
And the mm. second thing is he'd taken the hand that, that Gaethje would have based, his right hand at that time, he took that away from him and put it, like he secured it in his own arm as if he was going for that arm bar. So in order, by the time that Gaethje had switched his hips to even begin to get to his feet, his posture was broken, that his yeah. base hand was gone. And all he was all he was doing with his left hand was was tapping, right? And obviously yeah. the ref didn't see it. It looked like punches. It's whatever. It's fine. Gaethje goes out and it is what it is, right? The fight's over. But man, my God, what a performance. What a performance. It's incredible, wasn't it? And, and for him to get up as well um, and just the minute it was over, it was like all Come that on. sort of grief came back to him, yeah. which, you know, I've actually seen a similar thing um, with another fighter who in the middle of a camp had loads of difficult circumstances going on. And it's like, the goal of having someone in a cage about to fight you is such a big distraction. It can put that um, sort of grief to the back of your head for a while. But it was like the minute it was over, it all hit Khabib and, you know. And we yeah. should also point out, right, that losing a parent is, for anyone that's had it, like me included, is one of the hardest moments of your entire life, right? As a child, it's one of the hardest moments of your entire life. And, and I absolutely echo Habib's statements of keep your family close and, and make sure that you are, um, make sure that you spend as much time with your family as possible because at the end of the day, you have no idea when the day that you spend with them is going to be your last. And you have no idea as to, as to what is gonna happen with those people. What we see with Habib and the reason why I, I lent so deeply into my respect for his performance is it's not just the distraction of a man in a cage that, that allows you to pump, put that grief away, but imagine that that, that that grief is not just your father, but it's your head coach. So the place you're going to get away from that grief is self-contained grief as well because you're expecting your coach to be there to direct your training camps to do this and he's not there right you have to lean on your training partners you have to lean on yourself you have to lean on javier javier going out to russia to spend the last weeks with habib to act as that thing was obviously massive for him but we spoke in depth about how was this going to affect habib mentally it had to affect him it's impossible not to but is he going to be positive or is it going to be negative and my god was it positive i thought dan hardy said this beautifully at the end at the end uh, of the fight and he said that there is no lightweight in the world that was beating Habib Nurmagomedov that night you could have put prime anyone in there and I think Habib beats him you know he he posted afterwards about how um when you have God with you nobody can beat you but he had his father with him right and he truly had his father with him and and what we saw there with the outpouring I think was an outpouring of of disappointment that his father couldn't be there in person to see it. I thought we saw an outpouring of grief, an outpouring of love, an outpouring of everything that had happened, right? The, the bad camp. We obviously, we saw, and we're going to need to talk about this afterwards, but the, the weigh-in, right? There was clearly something that happened in that weigh-in that was a little bit dubious and whatever, but a terrible cut, a really hard training camp, the loss of a father, the loss of a coach, everything the fact that his mother didn't want him to fight without his father and he goes in and puts on the best performance of his entire career man you don't you can't write stuff like that you just can't write stuff like that no it was like jack said wasn't it like it's so rare that in mma especially you get a, a happy Fairy ending tale. or yeah. yeah and this this was honestly like something out of a film like it was like habib turning around to gaichi at the end and saying you know love your mum and dad and everything else it was it was a really, um, you know, it was a special moment for sure. It really was. It was one of the best moments. I've, I've been following MMA for a long time now, but it was one of the best moments I've ever seen. Mm. Jack, Jack says it best, right? MMA is often the cruelest mistress. That was the fairy tale ending that we never, ever get. And it couldn't have happened to a better fighter, right? Yeah. What Habib displays inside that cage is nothing short of brilliance. Genius, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and for him to be able to, to leave the sport, if that's what he so chooses, undefeated, 
He's only ever lost a handful of, less than a handful of rounds, right? You can argue McGregor won round one. You could argue he lost that. Clearly two or three judges scored this uh, just in round one. Fine. Imagine 29 professional fights. You've never been dropped. You've never been defeated and you lose two rounds. Yeah, I, I genuinely think um, with Habib, there's going to come a time because the sport's still still very young. But I think there's going to come a time in maybe like 10, 20, you know, maybe even longer than that, maybe 30 years where people look back at Habib's career and they realize how many years ahead he was of the rest of the competition. Yep. Like there are certain things that he did and obviously things that his, his father was responsible for bringing in where I honestly just think he was so ahead of the era that he fought him, which is just absolute madness to think about, really. But um, it's it's really interesting as well when you start talking about that that goat conversation and the pound for pound best that people were having afterwards. Like, I'd de- I'd, de- I'd be interested to hear your opinion on that about where where Habib sort of stands in the goat conversation because I I have a pretty pretty firm opinion on that one. So I think pound for pound, there is absolutely no argument that Habib Nurmagomedov is the pound for pound number one yeah. fighter. Yeah. I don't think you can, I don't think there is an arguable, not a solid argument against that right now. Because we, we must remember that pound for pound number one is about active fighters right now, right? Mm. So I do not see that there is any fighter out there alive today that puts on performances like Habib Nurmagomedov. Obviously, Israel Adesanya is undefeated. However, he's been dropped. He's lost rounds. And, I mean, I don't, I don't think he's ever been close to losing a fight, per se. The Kevin Gast- Calvin Gastelum was probably the closest he got to, to dropping a fight. And obviously, he had a close decision against Marvin Vittori. But, man... Habib goes in and, and people say this, right? People say that you can't be one thing in MMA. You can't have one thing. Habib says, cool, watch me, right? <laughs> His grappling is unbelievable. Like if you put Justin Gaethje and Habib Nurmagomedov in a boxing ring or a kickboxing ring, I would pick Justin Gaethje every single fight. Every single time I would pick Justin Gaethje. But this isn't that, right? <laughs> His, his wrestling is so, grappling, sorry, his grappling is so far ahead of anything that these guys have seen in one of the deepest divisions, one of the most history-rich divisions in the UFC and in combat sports in general, 155 pounds, is always been full of killers. It's the average size of a man, and Habib is not an average man in any way, shape, or form. So pound for pound, I don't see anything outside of Habib Nurmagomedov. Greatest of all time? <sighs> it's difficult, isn't it? So, yeah. So, I'll give my I'll thoughts. Just... Yeah, sorry. Sorry, yeah. I think that my thoughts are this. The general conversation is between uh, GSP, John Jones, and Demetrius Johnson. Let me give my argument for Habib Nurmagomedov in that picture. What GSP did was fantastic. He avenged every single loss he had and he did it in dominant fashion, right? But he lost. He came back after four years out, beat Michael Bisping, who, whatever, you know, I don't think Bisping's grappling was anywhere near the level of GSP's grappling and, and we clearly saw that. Um, John Jones had an amazing run, an amazing run to the title and had amazing title defenses, but again, has looked beatable. It's arguable that he lost the Dominic Reyes fight. It's arguably lost the um, the Tiago Santos fight. And he had one of the closest fights with Alexander Gustafsson that we've ever seen, right? I'll be very interested to see what happens to John Jones at heavyweight. And I'll be very interested to see what happens if he ever fights Izzy Adesanya. Habib has never looked close to losing, ever. Not once. John Jones has lost rounds. Habib lost two in his whole career, right? That I can remember. Demetrius Johnson. Demetrius Johnson styled on guys that were equally levels below him. But Habib has gone in and beaten and demolished guys 
that are world-class, top-of-the-food-chain fighters. You do not see people do what Justin Gaethje did to Tony Ferguson often. And Habib went in there and made Justin Gaethje look like a set, like, like a decent fighter, a good fighter. For me, Habib Nurmagomedov, I know this is probably recency bias, but Habib Nurmagomedov is the greatest of all time, in my opinion. Okay. I think, you know, I think you, you bring up some really good points there. Um, I was just going to say, in terms of recency bias as well, I think as MMA fans, like, we're probably more prone to it than anyone. Like, 100%. who knows if... If Izzy went up and, you know, had a good performance against John Jones, I could easily see us having the same conversation about John Jones. Of course. I'd say a couple of things first with the GOAT conversation, because this was a massive issue in boxing as well, which is you'll have some people try and have the GOAT conversation where they say, if you could get every fighter, put them all at the same way and have them fight each other, work. who wins those hypothetical matchups? Work. And obviously, yeah, it doesn't work because of all the variations of the eras they fought in and the divisions. So usually the next thing they go on is resume and achievements. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think in terms of resume, I still think that Habib is dwarfed when you're looking at people like John Jones, sure. when you're looking at people like GSP, Demetrius Johnson, I think in terms of the volume of names um, and also the different eras that some of these guys like GSP has, He's fought in nearly like three eras of welterweight and has had, you know, dominating performances in all of them. And and I think another interesting argument is like, uh, do you play much poker or anything like that? No. I know how to so, play. I do not play though. Yeah, it's, it's all right. I, I play like at a very casual level. But say you're playing a game of poker, yeah, and you have someone who in the first two hours of the game has the best streak ever and he wins loads and loads in poker. And then he says, right, guys, I'm cashing in. I'm going home, okay? Does it make him a better player than another person at the table who stayed there for four or five hours, had an equally as impressive streak, and then got to, say, the fifth hour and had a terrible streak and then fell off, you know? Um, who knows? But so my, Can I, sorry, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Just one question. Yeah. Does that analogy determine greatness or does it determine skill? Remember... The goat is greatest of all time. Well, what does greatness mean? That's the first question. Well, this is the thing. Okay. So I think in the greatest of all time, the usually the next thing people go to after resume, and especially if you're going by poker analogies, yeah. is they'll look at were they the greatest at certain things. So for example, this is where I think it becomes a little bit more simple. A lot of people will say greatness to me is who is the most dominant. OK, and also what division and era, what competition were they fighting against? Now, say, for example, we pick John Jones because he's angry on Twitter about <laughs> this at the moment. OK, so we'll pick John Jones in terms of dominance. If you're going career for career with Habib, I don't think there's any fighter in the history of the sport who you can match with Habib on pure dominance. Like Agree. you've looked at the stats that have come out and you were speaking about this already. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's absolutely insane. No one has got close. He's never been cut. He's never been dropped. Anything. Okay. Um, and also, um, when you're comparing him with John Jones, it's also, you've got to look at the division he fought in, like 155 pounds. I was like writing a little bit before this fight to sort of get my thoughts together for the fight and everything else. 155 has always been the weight class where consistency of victory was nigh on impossible the longest champions we've had if you look at someone like benson henderson has at the very best string some very close split decisions together okay you never had a guy who came and just just flattened everyone you know like habib and i think division like we've spoken about before when we were talking about daniel cormier another time division for me is a really big deal when you're d determining who the greatest is because you know, with John Jones, there's no doubt he went through a murderous row of people. But light Absolutely. heavyweight has just not been, it's not ever really been that division. The same it's way. It's either been Tito Ortiz, Chuck Liddell, or John Jones. Those are your big names, really. Yeah. Li yeah, literally. So, in terms of dominance and division, I don't think there's a guy that comes close to Habib. But again, I think the poker thing still kinds of stands because with these other champions, say someone like GSP 
or if John Jones keeps fighting for another five years, you've seen every single shade of that fighter from their prime, from their strongest all the way down to their weakest days and seen how they responded to that adversity. Okay. And I think with someone like John Jones and GSP, they get the edge in the resume for me just because they've been around longer. They fought a higher volume of guys. And like you say, there is something to be said for someone that rebounds from a loss. Like there is something quite great about that in and of itself. But yeah, for me, in terms of dominance and division, it's going to be a very long time until we find anyone as great as uh, Habib. I'm going to offer you one other top Trump category, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's influence. Who's changed the game? Mm. Uh, that's a great one. Um, just to, to jump on that, because that is a really good one. Because um, this is one of the things when we were talking about Daniel Cormier, I know you were saying he didn't have a, an impact on the game. And whether you're talking about the example Habib set, I think technically there are things that him and his dad have come up with um, that are literally complete firsts in MMA. And I think they'll probably change the way that MMA is fought as a whole. Either that or you'll get something like what happened with Marcelo Garcia at the ADCC, where he goes in with new techniques, smashes everyone, and then no one chooses to adapt. Like human beings seem to have a habit of doing that, right? But yeah, I think technically speaking, the impact that him um, and his father have had on the sport is like just completely unmatched, basically. The only person that I can say in my opinion, rivals Gaethje's influence is Demetrius Johnson. And the reason why I say that is because Demetrius Johnson is the first person we've ever seen at the highest level be a mixed martial artist who mm. was able to flow between grappling, striking, and wrestling exchanges with such fluidity. Like, John Jones on the feet was utterly creative, phenomenal, beautiful performances. But there was a very clear distinction between when he was striking and when he was grappling. GSP was similar. He had incredible karate fundamentals, incredible striking fundamentals. He was similar in a way to Habib that he employed a very simple, quote-unquote, style. Monster power double leg. Monster on the ground. Really beautiful Superman punch, great fundamental striking. And he put that together and that was the game plan. But those things with John Jones, that creativity, we've seen similar fighters, not at the highest level, granted. And with GSP, we've seen guys with amazing power doubles, with great striking. We've seen it. I don't think we've seen somebody fight as fluidly as uh, DJ. And equally, I don't think we've seen somebody grapple as dominantly as Habib. As you say, there are plenty of techniques that we've seen introduced by Habib Nurmagomedov and by Abdulmanap Nurmagomedov that we've never seen before. So I think we have to introduce division, resume, dominance, and influence. And yeah. for me, it's Habib Nurmagomedov. Yeah, I, I still think there's some of those categories he's short on because actually you bringing up the influence thing, which is a really good uh, top Trump thing to add. I actually think John Jones may actually be really high up there now I think about it. Like when you think of he was the first guy to throw those spinning elbows against Bonner and stuff like that. But I feel like we could literally talk about this until, you know, the cows come home, couldn't we? But I mean, frankly, the GOAT conversation and the pound for pound conversation is utter garbage. <laughs> yeah. It, it is. It's impossible. Nothing. It's so, yeah. I think you can literally only, like we've said, pick out a category and say he was the best ever. In terms of dominance, there has never been a career as dominant as Khabib Nurmagomedov. And that's the only Agree. thing we can say with certainty. Agree. Agree. And and frankly, I, I'm going to echo Jack's statements again that the MMA is often the cruelest mistress. And this was the fairy tale ending we never get, right? And that, to me, holds vast value i don't like you know you saying oh i want to see the full arc of a fighter him coming up him at his prime and him him losing fights and either responding really well or responding badly i don't want to see it right yeah what I, if yeah. i could see every fighter go out at their absolute prime that's good for me 
Yeah, no, you're you must right. remember that, is... that these people are humans. They're going in there and risking brain cells, bone structures, and their livelihoods for our entertainment. So yeah. for Habib to be able to go in there and execute the fairy tale, beat the guy who everyone was saying was the only guy that could beat him in the fashion he did, and then walk away into the sunset in the memory of his father, and just because he made a promise to his mother, mate. There's nothing better. No, it's amazing, isn't it? Sign me up. <laughs> yeah, and also just to defend myself as well. No, I don't fuck want that you. Whole career <laughs> <laughs> to make me sound like an absolute sociopath. Um, I think more. You are the is, just bleed guy. It, it has given. <laughs> I may be. It has just given them um, a longer career with more fights. I'll just say. I'll say that I'm the same as you. I think I'm just so used to fighters just never. Um, you know, it just very rarely happens the way Habib does. But you're right, all fighters should be like that. I don't want anyone. It's not like imperative someone stays in this unbelievably crazy sport forever for me to think they're a good fighter. I think he's done it perfectly. I agree. And, and you know, like we're, let me, let me paint this out to you because this could very well be another greatest of all time conversation we have in a year or two years is Robert Whittaker just won on the weekend. Izzy Adesanya and uh, Eugene Berman have already said that they're not really interested in a Whitaker rematch. You know what that means? What that means is Izzy Adesanya is going to 205 and he's going to fight Jan Blakowicz because there's nobody else at 205 that's really screaming out for a title shot, right? So he goes there, let's say he beats Uncle Jan and he calls out John Jones and says, I've got your title now. Let's fucking do this, right? Let's say John Jones goes back to 205 and Izzy beats John Jones. He's undefeated. Exactly. 23, 24 and 0 at that point. He's just beaten arguably, arguably the greatest of all time. He's gone up and done the double <laughs> champ thing. Mate. Then we're having another conversation about another whatever, whatever. But Yeah, because sorry, that's the that's the other issue, isn't it? With the with the GOAT talks in MMA, the sport's been around 25 years. Yeah. Like when someone in boxing, um, when they do the conversation in boxing, they're literally going off 600 years. Like yeah. when when this goes like a long time, so say if we get to the first century, there'll be people who are in our GOAT conversation now who in the, in the context of a century, we see as like good high-level fighters. You know, there'll be some guys in boxing because it's been going so long, they can cherry pick the absolute outliers, you know, but you, it is just a garbage conversation. It really is. It, it literally fun, is. But, yeah. It's two lads called Dave and Mike in the pub yeah. over a pint of Stella with a pack of nuts, right? <laughs> having a chat about whoever they think is fucking dominantly better, right? That's what it is. But look, it is, what I think is it, is it, it gives a platform to show the outliers of the sport. And if nothing more, Habib Nurmagomedov is one of the farest outliers of our sport, right? The farest outliers. Yeah. At the and moment. <laughs> at the time of speaking. Yeah. <laughs> but look, what I would love for Habib now is to, be, is to go down and to be remembered as everything that he was inside that cage as a fighter. Justin said it perfectly. He did his father unbelievably proud he did the millions of fans he has unbelievably proud he did his mother unbelievably proud and there's a video a small video that came out afterwards of coach javier mendez and all of habib and his team in the bus riding back to the w hotel and coach javier says what's next habib are you just going to help me and habib was like i will always help you coach javier <laughs> and it feels like it was written right? Like obviously from the culture yeah. and the religion that Habib comes from, he now takes on the responsibilities of his father. Yeah. And one of those responsibilities is a head coach to thousands of young Eastern European men that are now coming through. And Habib said in that, in that little excerpt that, that now it's his role to bring through the next Habib Nurmagomedov. God, it's crazy, isn't it? It is like it's a film. Beautiful. It's, it's absolutely yeah. beautiful. It's amazing. Gosh. And yeah, I don't think there's anything more I can say. No, no, I, th I think I think you've nailed it. I think you've nailed it. So, any final words, Sean, or, or are you happy to call time on just not the... just this podcast, but also 
it's just a phenomenal career. Yeah, it's it is just strange to have, you know, a weekend of fights where you actually sort of walk away feeling like quite emotional about the whole thing. It's mad, but um, you know, what a story and what what an ending to a career and and even like Robert Whitaker winning as well. I was just it seemed like the one time ever where, you know, you get those sort of those happy endings. But mm. um but yeah, it it was really good. It actually made me hate you a little bit less. I mean, I can't say it made me hate you any less. Um, <laughs> if it anything, wasn't that nice. if anything, you getting those two picks for the main and co-main event correct, and me f- fucking fumbling them, made me just disgusted with you ever more. Can I just say as well? There's actually a community of people now that are literally just there, um, wanting my picks to go wrong. Basically, like I get messages off at least five different people yep. the night of the fight saying, "I bet you're feeling stressed. Sean. <laughs> How are you feeling? Khabib's gonna get flying knee. How's yep. it going?" So, to all those people, you know, I had one good weekend, and I will ride on that. I'm gonna be referencing this probably in every podcast we have. Well, look, I feel really honoured to have helped to build that community and I will do my absolute <laughs> best to continue to build that community to make sure that it is 500 strong in the near future. But the one thing I do want to say on a, on a more serious note, not only that you're an absolute prick, but um, that we must also think of Justin Gaethje, right? Justin Gaethje held himself so brilliantly after that loss. He loses... And the moment he got choked out, right, he got back to his feet, ran around the commissioners and went to Habib, consoled him on the floor and, and told him how proud he was of him, how told, told him how proud his father would have been of him in the post-fight conference. He, he stuck around just to sing praises to Habib. When they embraced in the middle of the octagon, he said to him, you're a fucking monster. Like, all right, that's about as succinct as I can say it. Yeah. <laughs> in the post-fight press conferences, he then goes and sings Habib's praises again. That man will be back. That man will be back. And that man is just as much in the running for that title in Habib's absence as he was prior to that fight. That man is another glowing example of what MMA can do for somebody and, and the, the brilliant respect shown in that octagon in, in the brightest of times. And actually, I think that the way that Justin handled that and the respect shown between Habib and Justin Gaethje was something that just added to the fairy tale ending of, of, of this story. Right. Um, but other than that, I will, I will call time on not only this podcast, but also uh, the ode to, to Habib and his career. And I wish him and his family all the best in the future. Um, all I will finish this with is, uh, is I don't wish you all the best in the future, Sean. Uh, I hope that, um, that the next time I see you, I manage to single leg you into oblivion, uh, ultimately giving my back and getting choked out. But these things do happen in MMA. Um, and yeah, just a, just a, a shout to, to the guys listening and females listening is that if you can like this, subscribe this, share this as much as you can. Um, it's something that, that myself and Sean are, and Jack are, are really, really passionate about outside of the All Abouts Balance episodes. Uh, but yeah, if you could do that, that would be absolutely phenomenal. But yeah, for now, Sean, thank you very, 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 very much for your time. And I'll, I'll speak to you soon. Thank you, Eric.